Welcome to the Lessons from Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Brian Beckham. Well, happy 2024. I hope everybody had a great 2022. And I am super excited about what the year uh, is going to bring, both in terms of uh, this podcast and a bunch of other stuff we've got planned. So my next guest is uh, Gerald Leonard. He's my first guest of 2023. Uh, The episode is called Workplace Jazz. Gerald Leonard's been a professional musician for almost 50 years. Uh, he's primarily focused on jazz, jazz music, uh, but he's also the CEO of Principles of Execution, a certified minority business enterprise, and he's the author of the book Workplace Jazz, How to Improvise. Uh, in the podcast, Gerald and I talk about how to manage chaos, how his jazz experience uh, helps his advice to entrepreneurs and business owners, the power of listening, how artistic people can thrive in corporate environments, Uh, why to treat your employees like artists, and a whole lot more. I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I did. And now I give you Gerald Leonard. Hey, everybody, Brian Beckham, and I have got Jared Leonard. He is the CEO of Principles of Execution, and even more interesting to me, he's been a musician, a professional musician, for almost 50 years now, Gerald. Is that is that about right? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to age it. you. <laughs> I look much younger. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's probably been about 40, 48, 49. So you're about right. I'm like, wow, I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're about right. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting we're laughing about this because when I was doing some research on you uh, earlier yeah. this morning, I went on your LinkedIn page and it said, it said uh, it, it had your musical history and it said, I think, 1974, 1976. And I'm old yeah. enough to where that doesn't sound that long ago. But then when it said 47 years next to it, I was like, oh, my God, I'm getting old, too. I'll be 50 this year. So but anyway, so, you, you, you know, we were talking right before the podcast and you said something, you go. You said, man, I like a really f- free flowing conversation. Yes. And and I kind of like that, too. And I think maybe one of the reasons you. Uh, you like kind of the free flowing conversation is because one of the things that you've had a ton of experience with is jazz music. And part of the thing you you've, you've done with your musical career is you've figured out how to use the principles you've learned as a musician in a business context. And so I want to kind of get right into that, Gerald, if that's okay with you. So first of all, before, before we get too deep in the business principles, tell us a little bit about your background, where you come from, how you became a musician, how you translated your musical career yeah. uh, into the business career that you have yeah. now. Sure. Well, right on my shoulder, if you're looking at this on video, there's like a little red guitar. It has no strings and no knobs on it. And thinking about 47 years ago, uh, probably a little earlier than that, uh, is when I, I would go and steal that from my sister. <laughs> and it was, a, <laughs> it was a decent little guitar at the time. <laughs> And nice. I talked about it in my TEDx and, um, you know, she realized she wasn't going to play it. And so she let me have the guitar and she let me have it as a sister, just, t- you know, taking her stuff. But yeah. I fell in love with that little red guitar and that's why it's hanging up there because that's my beginning. Yeah. And I would literally just sit for hours and play that thing. And then I started getting pretty good and I joined a band with some friends of mine. Um, and it was around the time I grew up in Lakeland, Florida, which is on the East coast of the United States. Uh, And they created what's called the Lakeland Civic Center. And before that, you wanted to go hear a great band, like, you know, like one of the top 10, top 20 bands, R&B, rock and roll, whatever. You had to go to Tampa or Orlando. But now I could ride my bike, actually, or I could go with some friends and see all of these major, the Commodores, Earth, Wind and Fire, all these great guys. And that radically influenced my life. I mean, because as a kid, you get up close to the stage, you can watch them. And so I did my bachelor's and master's in music, studied classical and jazz. My, the guy I studied with doing uh, my master's had worked with David Walter. David was the principal uh, basis for Toscanini and the NBC Orchestra. So I actually yeah. had a year up in New York to study with him. Um, fast forward a little bit. I am also I did some ministry work and uh, got married and had a couple of kids. And you know I grew up with my dad always being there. Yeah. I can I can see him now getting up at 5 30 in the morning. And he he had his own business. He poured concrete. And I could just see him pulling things together. And so I felt very responsible 
that I needed to be there and my kids needed to see me, not just know that I was bringing a check in, but needed to see me every day. So I made a decision to stay local in the New York area playing and to do other things to make a living. And eventually I got into IT. And I realized that being a musician and the principles I learned really helped accelerate me into the IT world and then into the project manager because I was always very organized and detail uh, oriented. Fast forward even more into my career, I find myself sometimes playing gigs on the weekends or during the week. And then other times I'm leading a team of project managers and, and developers and leading these business teams and, and um, doing things at the National Archives and Defense Logistics Agency and so on. And I started noticing that business teams that work really well and were very effective had the flavor of being in a jazz band. Yeah. And yeah. that was everyone practiced really hard on their instrument, knew their stuff. But when they came together, they left that at the door and they focused on the big picture of the project. They had to le lean in and listen really well to each other. They had to compliment because you can't be angry playing music, right? You can't, you can't <laughs> be angry at your band members. You know, imagine yeah. guys are yeah. playing and it's like, I can't stand you. That's not going to work. So, that, so yeah, you especially have to something break. like, especially something with jazz where there's a exactly. lot of cooperation and a ripping of off of each other and stuff exactly. like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that led me to the place where I eventually wrote my first book, uh, Culture is the Base. And then eventually yeah. I wrote the second book, Workplace Jazz. And I just finished my third book, which is a business novel that uh, I'm wor working with a literary agent and a publisher right now. And it's called A, a Symphony of Choices. And all yeah. of them use music as a metaphor. And it talks about productivity and neuroscience and music and all these other things but I use what I know best is music and just the blessing that music has been to my life and how it's taught me. And it really helps me develop high performing teams for my company, as well as continually strive to be my best and keep growing myself. How do you have time? Cause there's going to be people listening to the show that are going to be like, man, Gerald is a busy guy. He's got a family. He he's works full time. He's a musician. How do you have time to write three books? Like, I, I mean, where, 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 where do you make the time to do that? Seriously, because there, there's there's people that I'm I'm like, I mean, I just don't know how people how people can manage all this stuff. So, how, how do what's your secret? <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting because, uh, and I did this before the incident happened, and I'll tell you about this incident. Um, but I look at my time and, you know, my availability as a constraint. And here's what I mean by a constraint. There's something in the, in physics called the Venturi effect. And I'll make yeah. this really simple. Um, think of that as you're watering your garden, right? And you pull out the hose. What do you do? You go to Best Buy or someplace or, or, or not Best Buy, you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you get a nozzle and you put on the end of your hose, and then you turn the water on. Well, what does that nozzle do? It constrains the water yep. so that you use actually use less water, but it sprays more. Yep. So when you think of a constraint, you think of how can I do less but cover more ground? So what led me to that, and this is uh, uh, one of the stories I always talk about that has radically changed my life in the last four or five years, it was in 2018, no, 2000, yeah, 2018, uh, in August, I had a major bout with vertigo. It wiped out my vestibular system, which is your balance system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It impacted my right inner ear nerve by 86%, so I only had 14% capability. Mm. I, I went, to, I was in the hospital for a day and a half, was rushed by ambulance. I'm, I'm saying, and the doctors are looking and saying, this is not normal. I'm like, yeah, it's not normal because I can't walk. I yeah. can only walk with a walker. And, and this was like, and this all happened six weeks before my TEDx talk. Okay. And so I lay in bed <laughs> for a week. I'm a, I'm a business owner and a contractor and I'm laying there, but my talk, because I've been doing a lot of research in neuroscience, my talk was what if practice is the performance, the neuroscience of music. And one of the things about musicians and anyone who plays music is that the brain is really activated when you're playing, right? Left and right hemisphere is always talking to each other. And if there's damage in your brain in any form or fashion, 
the brain begins to figure out how to work around that network or that damaged area and rewire itself. Yeah. So as soon as I could get up, I started practicing my bass, the one of those, one of those bases behind me, and just just play for an hour. So I think God, I can still play, and then I go back to bed. And literally, I'm like like using the walker to go back. Yeah. I did that for three weeks every day, and I just took small steps. It was walking to the end of the hall, walking downstairs, walking to the front porch, walking to the mailbox. And these were days. Walking to the front of the yard, walking down the street to the neighbor's house. And within three weeks, between practicing, praying, and, and walking, I walked into my ear, nose, and throat doctor's appointment, the first one, a major one I had, uh, unassisted. And he looked at me, he goes, I can tell you've been impacted. And after they've done the test, he goes, okay, what are you doing? And I told him I'm a musician. I'm preparing for my TEDx. I hadn't given that up. And three weeks later, God willing, I was on stage in Delaware delivering my TEDx talk, which is on, TED, which is on the TED platform right now. And you, if you watch it, I'm very gated. When I turn, I'm very deliberate because I was still very impacted. I still have this issue today. Um, and so I've had it since I started, I, not when I wrote my first book, but the second and the third book, I've had it. And I've just learned to live with the constraint. I don't call it a disability. I call it a constraint. So it's restricted some things that I can do, but there's other things that I can do that actually provide more value to, to myself, to my clients, to my network, to those that I'm involved with. And I get more done now and I have more time on my hands. Because because you have some constraints. That's so interesting because, yeah. you know, I've, I'm, actually I'm, done, I've actually done the theory of constraints training uh, that uh, Elliot Goldrad wrote the book, The Goal. And yeah. I work with a lady named D. Jacob who ran the Goldrad Institute. And I spent two weeks learning the concepts of the theory of constraints. And I apply that to my life every day. Beautiful. You know, and my father used to say, my father was an Air Force colonel, lieutenant colonel, raised me as a single father with my my brother and I. My mother died when I was 10. And yeah. he always used to say, my, you know, he has, he's still alive. He's 80 years old, but he, he has these things that he always used to say, and the older I get, the smarter he seems. But one of the things he used to say to me a lot is if you want something done, ask a busy person. And I think the idea behind that is, when you have const constraints are good, yeah. generally speaking, because you it forces you, it gives you uh, some motivation, it gives you some discipline to do things. Right. And if you had, so the way I look at it, Gerald, it's like if you had no constraints at all, like if you got up in the morning, you had nothing to do, you had no deadlines, you had nothing you had to go, nobody had to go see anything like that, life would be boring as hell. It's the fact that we have a limited amount of time and a right. limited amount of attention that makes life interesting. It's just like exactly. that to me, and pardon me if the, this metaphor is not a good metaphor for a musician, but you have constraints in music too, I would think. Like there's a framework in which you have to work, but it's within that framework where the, where the magic happens. If there was no framework whatsoever, it would just be a cacophony of you know, noise, essentially. It's the right. fact that there's a structure, right. that there's a constraint to it, that makes it uh, so beautiful, don't you think? Exactly, exactly. And, it, and the, the idea of a constraint is that it forces you to prioritize. Yeah. And it forces you to really be aware of time. And, and more importantly, it forces you to be aware of energy. Yeah. Because, you know, we have, in some ways as humans, we can have unlimited energy because we we actually can create energy within ourselves if we learn sure. how to use our bodies correctly, the yeah. meridians and the the, you know, the the energy systems in our, our, our bodies. We can go through the day without drinking coffee and kind of wake ourselves up for, you know, I did that today, right before we got here on the podcast. I did some exercises, did some things to kind of get my energy up so yeah. I could uh, do a great interview. Um, and so there's like little things like that that I've had to learn. Also learning how the brain works and and the best way to work in regards to how the brain works so yeah. that you can you can learn faster you can read more you can memorize more um you can be more productive i'm i'm a i am a list person i, I make a list every day and every night and I, I i prioritize that list and i i live by my list of things i need to get done but not from the standpoint of not being human i'm not caring about people but i just know here's what i got to do next Here's what I'm going to do today. 
here's what I'm going to do. And I only have so much time before my energy wanes. So I got to get it done and I got to be disciplined. Then I can go take a nap. And I do. I, I actually, now I do take naps at times. I, I do too. I, 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 as a matter of fact, there was, I tell people there was, a, I, I'm aging myself a little bit when I talk about this particular <laughs> okay. show, but there used to be a show, the Paul Harvey show on the radio. Yeah. And I'm sure you remember it, but at the end of the day, what Paul Harvey would do at the end of the do, deal, he would always say, and he would have like this introduction and he would say, and now I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. And I'll never forget. I was listening. This is 25 years ago. He, he's listing off all these famous people, Ronald Reagan, JFK, Winston Churchill, just boom, 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 20 different people. You're like, what do all these people have in common other than being famous? And at the end of the deal, he said, they all took naps. Every single one of them took a nap in the afternoon. Churchill used to take a nap for about an hour and a half at three o'clock or so in the afternoon. Yeah. He said he would actually have a day. Everybody had a day and he had a day and a half because of his nap. But I'll tell you something you said, I want to flag real quick, Gerald, because yeah. I think this is super important and I think it's super insightful. I think there's a lot of people that when you're talking about organizing your day yeah. and organizing your week, they have this idea that, you should just kind of schedule things and okay, I'm going to put this task in this block. I'm going to put this task in this block, this task in this block without any thought to where's my energy level, where's my yeah. attention level, where's yeah. my motivation level. So what I've started to do is I'll do all what I call my deep work uh -huh. in the morning when yeah. my kids are off at school and my yeah. brain is fresh. And I start, yeah. I actually started doing that about, six or seven years ago, I won't even go into the office now uh, for at least two or three hours yeah. because I want to sit there and absolutely focus on the most important thing I can think of. And then the, in the afternoon, when I start to lose a little bit of energy, you start to lose glucose in your brain. I mean, people don't know that like for people like you and I and, and any professional, really, your job is to make decisions and decisions take energy. They take glucose oh, yes. out of your brain. So you get to a point where you're, it's decision fatigue. You just can't make as good a decision. So what I try exactly. to do is I try to plan my day such that the the consequential decisions that I'm yeah. going to make are made when I have the most energy, the most attention, and the less consequential decisions like responding. Most emails are completely inconsequential. Doing email and stuff, I try to save that for the very end of for the later, day. Yeah. So yeah. talk a little bit about what, what I really want to hear from you today, Gerald. I'm going among a, a lot of other things, you know, I can already tell we could talk for two or three hours about a bunch of this stuff. I'm fascinated in a bunch of this stuff you're talking about, but, but talk seriously about making it uh, like how a team and business, whatever business yeah. it is, is, is like a jazz man. Because what I think about is a sports team or a military military organization because yeah. i grew up playing sports and i and i'm a military brat and i grew up in a military lifestyle and so that's the met those are the two metaphors when i'm running my business that kind of come to my mind i think the jazz metaphor is better <laughs> frankly better right because like you were saying earlier uh, like a jazz band or a mu like a musical band of any kind they have to work together, but the individual parts have, they each have a different role to play and they've right. got to play their role appropriately. Some people have just different personalities and you kind of coax out the performance in different ways. And it's not the, the problem with the military analogy is it's a little rigid. Right. Where, right. Whereas the musical analogy of the jazz, there's some structure to it, but there's also some leeway and some latitude within yeah. that structure. So, so talk about kind of your fundamental hypothesis and what you teach business people about how business is sure. like running a jazz band. Sure. And, and again, I, I write about this in, in uh, definitely my first two books around culture and also the workplace jazz concept. And really what I did with that was to look at my experience as a musician of what were the things that, uh, that myself, others that we played together and just watching other famous musicians or guys I've gotten to know who are running some really good bands, uh, how they work. And the, the first thing is you have to work on yourself. Yeah. In other words, you have to bring your A game to the table. I um, love that. All, I all, love that. all of the great musicians, they do. They, 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 they're, and that's what I loved about, that's what attracted me to being a musician was I saw these older men, you know, and they weren't like getting 
stiff and bored and, and, and boring. They were constantly learning. They were, they, they were hip. They were, they were looking at the latest things and, and really digging in. And so they were constantly growing, even though they were older, they were constantly learning. And that just fascinated me. So, so that's one of the main things is, is that you have to deliberately practice and constantly be approved, improving your own skill set, getting better at everything that you do and every part of your instrument, really mastering it, becoming a master of your instrument. Secondly, it really requires you to have a positive attitude in working with those around you. And uh, I did a, a certification in conversational intelligence. And when we are positive with each other on a, on a call, in a team meeting, we and even if there's someone who's negative, we can impact them with activities and conversations to where everyone in the room's brain is producing serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and GABA. You know, all those positive neurochemicals that create a bonding relationship. So, so when musicians get together, yes, they've worked on their skill, but now they're coming together and they have the big picture of the performance or the song in mind. And they go, okay, what do you need me to play to make the song work? Now, I can play a whole lot of stuff that has nothing to do with the song to show you how, bad, how, how quick I can play and what I've learned, but it has nothing to do with the song. So they submit themselves to the bigger picture and figure, okay, how can I make the song its best? Am I just playing whole notes with vibrato and, and creating a rich tone? Or am I pl playing funk with my thumb? Or am I picking and playing like a blue bop or a bebop type thing? It depends on what the song is all about. And it depends on everyone working together. It also requires you to listen. And when you're listening as a and, and when you're listening as a musician, you're not just listening to respond. You're listening to, <laughs> you know, because a lot of times we listen, especially as professionals, we listen and we're already thinking about our response and we're just kind of waiting for the pause so we can jump in and add our piece. I tell so, my clients we, in my in my law business when I'm talking to my clients sometimes. I'll say something like the other side has a story like your right. story is not the only story and when they tell their story I want you to listen <laughs> and I always say and not like I listen to my wife when she's talking <laughs> and I'm sitting there literally thinking in my head what I'm going to say in response to her I'm not paying any attention to her exactly like really really listen to listen like listen to learn yeah listen because you want to learn Right. Yes. So, so as a musician, when you first start learning to play, you, you listen, right? You listen to other musicians, yeah. you listen to songs, you listen for the tone, you listen for the pitch. Is he playing with his fingers? Is he playing with his thumb? Is he on the lower strings of the bass? Is he on the upper strings? Is he playing in the higher register? You know, is he using vibra? I mean, you, you're, you're beginning to die and you spend hours doing that. So when you come into a conversation, you hear what they say, but you hear their pitch. Yeah. You hear the inflection you're like mm, that was incongruent because they said this but they went this way there's something going on there so you begin to hear and see the the all of the emotional things inside the conversation so you become a better conversationalist because you become a really really good listener and it's yeah. called it's like you said deep work it's called deep listening and i think yeah. really good teams learn to really listen to each other also um when you're playing jazz um you know, someone start who start off and everybody's playing from the same page. Um, one person's probably or two people are playing the melody, right? And then someone they we keep playing the same track of or the the map of the music, and then someone takes a solo, right? So that soloist is they're giving their interpretation of the melody. Now they may have you know there could be multiple different ways to interpret it. And so everyone else in the band has to what I call surrender to support. So this, you know, the, the horn player is taking the solo now. So we're all going to surrender, play our parts, but we're all going to listen to where what his intent and what he's trying to communicate. And we're going to change our style of playing to map to his interpretation of that melody. Now, the piano player may have a totally different interpretation of what he thinks the melody should sound like for him and he may add a lot some more you know pizzicato and, and and chords and different things that he's doing on the keyboard and then again everyone tunes in we're playing the same same chart 
but everyone tunes in and listens to his style. And now you hear a different thing happening. And so the music is always very, and every night, if you play the same song, it's like a different song because yeah. everyone mm -hmm. interprets the their own melody a little differently and everybody's listening. So how does that relate to business and work? Well, you know, I really encourage the teams I'm on and the teams that I lead to one, listen, but I also encourage them that when they're, someone else in the group is taking a solo, everyone needs to support that person and really intently listen. And one of the best ways to teach that is to model it. Yeah. That when they see the CEO of the company um, and, and, and someone else is doing a part of a presentation and they see you taking notes and listening, well, guess what? They're going to like, wait a minute. Okay, if he's taking notes and he's intently listening, I better be taking notes because he may ask me, do I know, like, what does she say? And what was what was her intent? And what what where were we trying to go with that conversation? Uh, he, he may challenge me on that. So I need to be aware. And if they see you are a learner and are you constantly growing, then they want to get on board too. Yeah. And, and I think people get more uh, challenged by seeing a leader who sets an example and then coaches them through the process than they had from a leader who just says, go do this and go do that, but they don't see them modeling the process. And so, you said, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, you, you, you said so many good things there. I want to kind of break that down just a yeah. little bit. So I heard you say essentially three things, maybe four, B big picture. Number one, you got to work on yourself. Yep. Number two, you got to be have a positive attitude about working with teams. Yep. Number three, you have to listen. Yes. You have to listen carefully. And number four, you have to model the behavior you, you, you want to see from your team. So I could not agree more with every single one of those principles. I'll tell you, let's, let's talk a little bit about the first principle. So I'm a meditator. I'm a biohacker. I'm a self-improver. I'm that kind of person. Like you, you probably have a lot of those characteristics too. And some of the time, yeah. You know, historically, I was like, man, I'm spending so much time meditating and lifting weights and getting trying to stay in shape and trying to learn stuff that maybe I'm being a little selfish. And, you know, I forget who it was that told me this, but they said, look, you can't help anybody if your life is a mess. So right. you got to make sure, just like you said, you, you got to make sure you're as good as you can be. And in the in the musical world, the metaphor is you got to be the best musician you can be in order to bring something to the table for everybody else right. in the athletic world same deal in the off season you got to you got to do the work to get ready right. for the, whatever whatever sport you're playing whatever season it is military same thing you got to do the training right you got to get yourself where you need to be so people if you're listening to this podcast and you're worried a little bit about maybe i'm spending a little bit too much time on myself i would say that spending time making yourself a better person in whatever way you do it is the most generous thing you can do for your family and everybody around you. Yeah, like you think about the think about Stephen Covey with the seven habits, and one of the most yeah. important habits was sharpening the saw. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You think about the, the you, you, you think about the famous Abraham Lincoln saying like, and I, I'm going to mess it up, but I, I think it was Abe Lincoln who said, they said, you know, if you were going to cut this tree down, how would you spend your time? And you know, he said, I spend ninety percent of my time sharpening my saw, essentially, exactly. and ten percent cutting. And it's like exactly. measure twice, cut once, hundred percent. You you have to get your own house in order. And I would say that kind of is connected to your fourth principle, which is modeling behavior. Yeah. If you want people to be to to achieve certain things, you have to model it as a leader. Like if you want people to be a members of a, of a team, a good, good team members, you have right. to be a good team member. Exactly. How do you be a good team member? You have to work on your ability as to a teammate. Like, right. You got to yeah. learn, learn the principles of being a good team. And here's 100%. one of the things, here's one of the things that I think I learned for, as a, in music early on in, in my musical career, musical journey in life, even as a teenager uh, and, and a kid just trying to want to play better, was I, I was the youngest of six, right? Yeah. I grew up in, Lake, in Lakeland, Florida, Central Florida. Mom and dad did a great job of taking care of us, but they told us, if you want to do a lot of extra stuff, we're, you know, we don't have those resources with eight of us around the table. So you're going to have to go to work. So if you want to buy a base, if you want to play base, and you want to own a base, you're going to have to do some work and go buy a base. Yeah. And then yeah. if you want to get better at it, 
and they didn't say this, but basically what I pulled from it was, okay, I got a base and I'm learning how to play and I'm doing certain things on my own, but my other buddies over here are getting really good. I'm going like, man, I need a teacher. I need somebody who's going to show me how to show me the ropes, <laughs> but that costs money. Yeah. And so I had to go out and do chores, mow some lawns and do some other things to make money to then go find someone to tell me what I was doing wrong. Yeah. That, that lesson has never left me because up to this day, I'm 59. I have probably six professional coaches. Nice. And I nice. invest a lot of money on myself in development, whether it's a neural, whether it's a coach who's an expert, who's a PhD in neuroscience, who coaches me on, on, you know, accelerated learning concepts and whole brain learning and things like that, or, you know, being able to, to learn and work with Jack Canfield or um, just, just a number of the other folks that are that, you know, within the literary world who are, you know, some of the best in the business in that area that I've hired as my coach to help me to figure out how, how do I navigate? How do I pull the right team together? And it's not about being the smartest guy in the room. It's about pulling the smartest people out there in the room with you. 100%, 100%. And you know, that, that principle applies. I was talking to an Air Force Colonel who was a former Thunderbirds pilot. And we were talking a little bit about leadership and how to interact with your the, the people you work with that maybe don't have the same rank. I, I'm not, I, I don't like saying I'm your boss. I like saying colleagues. That's just, right. I think that's a better way to put it. But people maybe with less experience. And, you know, one of the things he said, Gerald, was uh, I listen to my people because I don't know everything. That like, exactly. The reason that I have people working with me is because they're better at certain things than I am. And if I didn't listen to what they had to say, I'd be, I'd be a dumbass, pardon my language, but, right. but like, that's the reason people there. And, and, and at my firm, like at my law firm, I have a, I have a pretty simple rule, which is you're not allowed to tell me about a problem unless you also, also offer a solution because telling me, exactly. I'm like, telling me about the problems, is easy. anybody can tell me about the problems. I could literally hire anybody off the street and I could say, they, these are the problems you got to deal with. Right. I hired you John Smith or Jane Smith, I hired you for your brain to help me solve these problems. And I hired you because I think you're better at solving certain problems than I am. And exactly. so, so the other principle you, you, you talked about, we talked about listening a little bit about, I, I actually think listening, like active listening is a skill that can mm -hmm. be developed. I think it's yes. a way to show respect yes. to the people you're talking to. I mean, if you're if I'm talking to you, Gerald, right now about, you know, sports or music or whatever, and you're texting somebody, that's not very respectful, right? No. And we've gotten, to the, we've gotten to the point in our society where it's it's almost like normal. I mean, it used to be five, 10 years ago, you kind of get upset if somebody wasn't paying. Oh, well, he's just looking at his phone. Everybody looks at their phone nowadays. And so right. if you want to differentiate yourself from everybody else, pay closer attention, ask yes. questions. Yes. Don't don't be thinking about when somebody's saying we have this we have this brain that is fascinating. And Gerald, you brought up some neuroscience principles. So I know you're familiar with this. But one of the, one of the weird things about our brain and people are to listen, you, you can do this experiment on your own. When somebody's talking to you, a lot of the time, the default state is to be thinking about what you're going to say in response. Exactly. It's not to be thinking about really deeply like what is this person getting at what are they saying i want to make right. sure i understand what they're saying and, I, and i'll tell you finally on this listening thing gerald that you cannot in my opinion as a lawyer i've studied persuasion for 25 years mm -hmm. and, and as a philosopher and somebody and a computer scientist who's really interested in the way the brain works and cognitive science right i don't think you can persuade people until you know where they're coming from first exactly like, until you know what somebody's thought process is about whatever it is you're talking about yeah how the, how the hell are you going to persuade them like how are you going to tell them a story that resonates with them if you don't even know what story they're telling each other in their head right right now? right exactly right. you don't know what you're combating and it's funny I'll, I'll share this little story with you um you know and you'll you'll get this because as a lawyer i um was hired a number of years ago coming from a consulting firm into a major law firm. And I won't say the name of the firm, but it was in the, it was probably in the top 20 of the AMLAW 100 firms. Yeah. And I was running their planning and program office. 
Um, they were five countries, 14 offices, and you know, Ivy League lawyers and so on. And so the staff, the supporting staff was extremely bright. I mean, yeah. really, really smart people. And it was a little intimidating, but I had spent a lot of time out in the field, you know, doing project management and so on for a long time. So I had a lot of skills that they were looking for. That's why they hired me. Well, in and in the CIO was the same way, is that when he and I first came on, the first thing that we did, and it was interesting, we came on at different times, but the first principle we had laid out in our roadmap for the first 90 days or whatever, was a part of that was devoted to listening to all of the managers. And I literally just kind of went around, you know, different parts of the country to where the, the offices were and just sat down and said, okay, what's working? What's not working? What do you want to see better? Yeah. And just, and just took notes and took notes and analyzed so that by the time I took the plan that I was going to implement, modified it to meet where they were and realized that, okay, to roll this huge program out to make them a project management powerhouse and do this sophisticated portfolio management stuff to lawyers who could care less about it because they just want to practice law and yeah. the administrators just want to do inventory and make money and, and kind of process that with the paralegals, I had to speak their language. Yeah. And I had to do it in a way that spoke to their pain points and to their gain points. And so I broke the training down into four parts for the C-suite. I did an hour presentation that spoke in their language about what we needed for them to do their job in this area and what we needed for them to be effective and how that was going to benefit them. For the managers who could barely get off their desk and go to a meeting, we did desk side service. So I trained all my project managers to go to the desk. We did training and it was like 15 minute training. Can you do this? Yes, you can. Great. That's all we're going to cover today. But over time, it really moved the needle because we got the C-suite aligned. We got the managers who were too busy aligned. I got the project managers. I was doing lunch and learns and mentoring and coaching them and them seeing me help them work things out. And then for all of the other folks who were in the staff that were that were doing this kind of work, we had I trained their trainers and then let them do the teaching and just kind of made sure that they were following a process. So in other words, it was almost like Chain, turning around a large boat using tugboats yeah. yeah and yeah. just as we as each of the tugboat pieces came together it changed the trajectory of that firm when it came to execution and project management and so on and so forth and they started really cranking out a lot of work and getting some massive things done that they had on their plate to modernize their systems and so on and so forth that they weren't able to do before because they weren't aligned from a project management standpoint, but it took but, listening. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, Joe, when you're talking about this, you're kind of giving me goosebumps a little bit because I'm thinking about two things. I'm thinking about if I were an employee and you came to me and said, here's our plan and here's what you're going to do to execute our plan, I would have one reaction. Right. Whereas if you came to me and said, what do you think the problems are? What do you think we need to work on? Right. My reaction is going to be totally different. I'm going to be completely, I'm going to be way, way more motivated to exactly. participate in whatever you're doing. And the second thing I think about, so this is a practical example of that years ago, almost 20 years ago now, before I started my own business, I had two bosses. I worked at a law firm. There were two partners. I had yeah. one partner who would literally sit down every Saturday morning and dictate hundreds and hundreds of tasks that I was supposed to do that week. And then the next Saturday, he would gripe at me about everything I didn't get done. Right. I had another partner who, who would say, here are 30 cases. If you have any questions, ask me. Otherwise, go, go get them done. Go win these cases for me. Well, who do you think I worked harder for? <laughs> you know, the first, the first, seriously, the first person I literally would I'd go through this task list, try to do as much as I possibly could, but that was it. Right. The other guy, I was like, whoo, man, he really trusts me. I mean, I was like exactly. a second year lawyer at the time. That's a lot of responsibility. I'm going to do, I'm going to go above and beyond for this person because he's shown me. Right. That he trusts me and he respects me as a human being. So right. what 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 a what what a great way to to talk about it. I'll tell you the other thing. I, I 
many, many years ago, I went to a seminar where we were kind of trying to learn some psychology and some psychotherapy and stuff. Anyway, we did this, we did this exercise where we put two chairs back to back and one mm -hmm. person would sit in one chair and one person would sit in the other, you face in the other way. And you would start talking about basically to yourself about some problem you had. Right. And then the person behind you, their job was to listen as carefully as they could. And then to say what you were saying in a way that was even clearer. And it was absolute magic. Cause I was sitting there at the time I just started my firm and I was sitting there going, I'm worried that it's not going to work out. And I'm worried that I'm, my business is not going to make it stuff like that. And the right. person behind me literally started saying, I've never failed at anything in my life. I've never failed publicly. I'm afraid to fail publicly. And he was like, <laughs> tell me, he was like, the words he was using to describe what was going through my head were better than the words I was using. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I felt like somebody really, really understood what I was going to. And it was right. such a great feeling, Gerald. I mean, yeah. to be listened to nowadays and to be listened to deeply is such a good feeling because it's it's pretty rare, right? Right, it is. Well, it's a, it's a it's a it's the ultimate sign of respect to yeah. when you because when you really sit down and listen, it's like you know. Again, I'll go back to Stephen Covey. I don't know why he's popping in my head today, but um, you know, it's that seek first to understand, then to be understood, yeah. Yeah. because many times it's like when you listen to someone and you really listen to them you're giving them oxygen. You're giving them a chance to breathe, right? Because they're getting a chance to express what's going on. And they're, you know, their brain begins to go, wait a minute, this guy's, or this person's really listening to me. Yeah. They are parroting back what I'm saying. They're not trying to respond. They're not trying to fix me. They're trying to understand me. And their brain begins to produce oxytocin, dopamine. It literally produces positive neurochemicals when we feel like we're being listened to. So then what do we want to do? Law of reciprocity. We want to return the favor. Tell me about your, you, know, you finish the conversation. You're like, okay, that's great. And they're like, please tell me about you. Now they're dying to know about you. And they really want to listen to you because now they, they feel like you have given them this gift, which you have. Not only have you listened to them and respected them, but you've allowed their brain to release a feel good chemical that they're like, wow, somebody really cares enough to even listen. And that's a big, you know, that's so much of that needs to be done today in the world with all that we have going on. The big, one of the biggest problems is we don't listen to each other. We don't listen to the other side and we need to listen more to each other. I'll tell you, the other thing is part of listening is asking questions, asking good questions. Right. And, and here's a little secret that a lot of people don't know. If you want to temporarily hijack somebody's mind and control their mind, ask them a question. And so yeah. for, for instance, like, with kids let's say your kid is on a diving board looking down at the water he's five years old and going i can't do this i can't do this I, there's no way i'm too scared that's I'll, if i jump that far i'll die i'll hit the water right. and i'll die if you sit there and go you can do it you can do it you can do it you can do it that's one way to do it the other way to do it is to say have you thought about what it would feel like if you were successful or have you thought about what it would look like if instead of being nervous about this musical performance right that the performance is over and literally when you ask a question that your brain the recipient's brain has to think about the subject that you're talking about so right. so it, the asking questions is not only like we're talking about the right thing to do it's a good thing to do it shows people respect it builds right. teamwork but it's also good for you <laughs> right? because yes. because you can get you can keep people on the track that you want them to be on um, exactly Exactly. So Gerald, this is, this is, uh, I knew this was going to happen. We've gone almost an hour and I'm, I'm actually trying to make my shows just a little bit shorter because, <laughs> because I want people to listen to all of them, but, but you're, you're such an interesting guy. Tell people before I let you go, tell people, uh, where they can find you on the internet. You've got, uh, your current book, you've got a book that I think you said you just recently published. Right. I just wrote that's yeah. being, that's being published. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll come out in 2023. Nice. Um, you can you can find me at GeraldJLeonard.com. Yeah. One of my newest projects uh, and companies is uh, ProductivityIntelligenceInstitute.com. Nice. ProductivityIntelligenceInstitute.com. Uh, there's a lot of information there about productivity. There's some there's some free um, articles and, and and tools and things, and it's really about 
being productive intelligently so that we can, you know, and learning how to use that constraint to get way more done in far less time and really have your life. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, Gerald, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Like we talked about beforehand, uh, before we went on the air, my goal or one of my goals with this podcast is to feature people like you, people that are positive, people that are inspirational, people that are making a little dent in the universe in a positive way. So my friend, thank you for coming on today and thank you for everything that you do and will continue to do. Excellent, Brian. Thank you so much for having me and I'm really happy to be here. Awesome.